Presentation con Felix Salmon, eh, senior editor di Fusion, ex eh, eh, reporter eh, economico e media critic for, eh, per eh, Reuters, alla ricerca di un, eh, di un, di un giornalismo post-testuale, come vi spiegherà più tardi, come ha detto di recente. E oggi vi parleremo di, dei wonk, dei secchioni, cioè quelli che stanno cercando attraverso la loro scienza di creare qualcosa di nuovo nel giornalismo. Non so se qualcuno di voi ha mai visto Breaking Bad o qualcosa di simile. Bene, eh, quello che stanno cercando di fare questi giornalisti è fare più o meno qualcosa di simile a Breaking Bad. Ossia abbiamo un, un secchione, un professore di chimica che cerca di utilizzare le proprie conoscenze per creare un nuovo tipo di, di metanfetamina e un ragazzo di strada che sa come funziona il drug dealing e la creazione di di nuove sostanze, creando un mercato del tutto nuovo, un nuovo tipo di metanfetamina, quindi un nuovo tipo di platea, un nuovo tipo di, di mercato, imponendo al mercato quindi un nuovo, eh, un nuovo prodotto, nuovi paradigmi. Il mercato è costretto a creare nuovi prodotti e questi, questa coppia di, di spacciatori, di creatori di droghe, eh, trovano il modo per sfondare. Quest'oggi appunto parleremo di Wonk, nerd, i nerd applicati al giornalismo, cosa stanno cercando di fare nel giornalismo? C'è questa tendenza americana, eh, portata avanti di recente soprattutto da Nate Silver, e con eh, siti come Vox.com, da Ezra, Ezra Klein, eh, c'è 538 di Nate Silver appunto, eh, c'è The Upshot di recente di, del New York Times, che stanno cercando di creare qualcosa di nuovo attraverso appunto il loro mestiere da nerd, da gente che lavora sui dati, e cerca di renderli commestibili a, ai lettori per creare un nuovo tipo di giornalismo un giornalismo che sia più appetibile che sia concorrenziale sul mercato e eh, che sappia vendersi eh, per usare un parallelo fatto da, da Jay Rosen un, un altro famoso media critic immaginate di avere eh, di essere bombardati da pop up di, di aggiornamento per un software che non avete mai installato Bene, voi non avete installato questo software, magari non vi interessa, ma i pop-up continuano in a inondare il vostro schermo. Questi pop-up sono, in questa, secondo questa metafora, gli aggiornamenti di notizie. Se voi non avete seguito le notizie dall'inizio, ovviamente questi pop-up, questi aggiornamenti, vi sembreranno fastidiosi. L'obiettivo di questo giornalismo, appunto, è far sì che questi aggiornamenti continui siano meno fastidiosi, più potabili, più eh, seguibili dai, dai lettori, che cominciando a appassionarsi a questo nuovo tipo di costruzione di notizie, fatto soprattutto per il web, per il digitale, attraverso testo, scrittura, video, infografica, cercano di educarli e creare appunto un nuovo mercato, così come per la droga in Bricky Bad. Eh, la domanda da fare resta solo questa, può funzionare una cosa del genere soltanto una bolla così come dal, dal post scritto appunto da Felix Salmon che è un po' le, eh, la guida a questo panel oppure sono destinati a fare la, la stessa parabola, a percorrere la stessa parabola dei due protagonisti di Breaking Bad senza offrirvi spoiler? <ride> Felix Salmon saprà spiegarcelo. So thank, thank you for that. And, um, oops, wow, okay. So, um, so, number one, this is the single most beautiful place I've ever talked. And what you should really do is just pay no attention to me and just look at these gorgeous murals and paintings and altarpieces and everything around you because that's where, the, that's where all of the really interesting stuff is going on. Um, so I... Um, don't really know what you're interested in. I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes or so, 30, 40 minutes, we'll see. And then I'm sure your questions are going to be more interesting than anything which I have to say. So we'll try and do some, some interesting Q&A stuff. Um, but let's start with, see it does that. I've noticed this, all of the talks, when you, when you turn your back, it suddenly turns into video. Um, <laughs> let's, let's do a little bit of, history first, because I think if you, the, the wonk bubble, the wonk renaissance, this whole thing which, you know, Vincenzo was talking about, um, starts making a lot more sense if you put it into, let me get rid of this, it's a horrible thing, um, if you put it into a little bit of historical perspective. So, let's start here, I don't know if you can really see this, but um, what we're looking at here is um, a history of the internet, basically, from 1995 to 2009. Um, 
where the blue bars, uh, well, basically, you know, the number of people connected to the internet starts at about um, 16 million people in 1995 when, when Netscape goes public. Goes up to about 1.7 billion people in 2009, which is 25% of the world's population. And then after 2009, for the sort of five years since then, um, it kind of doesn't even make sense anymore to talk about being online or not being online. The internet is just a thing which surrounds us and we're always connected to, and everyone in the world has a phone and every phone is connected to the internet. And, you know, we're not quite universal. There are parts of Africa which, you know, aren't completely connected. But the idea that you, you know, the idea that the internet is a separate thing, um, I think has more or less gone away. It's just, a, it's just like, you know, it's asking a fish what water is at this point. But the point of this is that we have been a mass medium. The, the, on the internet has been a medium for mass communication for a good 15, 20 years at this point. That even way back when we have that tiny little, tiny little bar in, in 1995, there were 16 million people. That's 16 million people, which, you know, if you have a newspaper in Italy with the circulation of 16 million, that's mass media. So, um, you know, we, we have astonishing numbers here. And we've had those astonishing numbers for a long time now. But what's interesting is that we haven't really been doing anything web native for most of that time. So we were briefly. So very early on, so uh, 95, 96, around there, um, you had this web native content. We have this site which you might have heard of called Wikipedia launched around then. Um, you know, it had links, everything was, was based on, uh, you know, using the hypertext protocols to do things which you couldn't ever have done before, and crowdsourcing and all of these amazing ideas which are completely new. We had online publications like suck.com, which again were based around the concept of the hyperlink and the, and the idea that you could have individual voice and write in a way that was inconceivable um, on, in, in print or in any other medium. And there was a feeling, if, I don't know how many of you were online in those, in those days, but there was a feeling that there was something very new here and very exciting. And that feeling <laughs> didn't last long. What happened is that we wound up being sort of, the juggernaut started rolling in. So this is the first homepage of the New York Times. This is the original nytimes.com. And the <coughs> rules of the internet, which had been laid down and were incredibly intuitive and sensible, you know, as, uh, you know, which, which were more or less invented by Tim Berners-Lee and people like that, basically got broken. Um, so this page, this, you know, it is a page, this was the home page of, of New York Times, so had no text on it. It had no links on it. It was just one image. And all of those things which looked like words were not actual words. You, if you went into the page source, you wouldn't see any words. You would just see an image. And then depending on where you clicked on the image, you would go to a different story or a different section. And then when you went to that story, the story would have no hyperlinks. It wouldn't be connected to anything. There was nothing web native about this at all. It was basically a way of taking an old-fashioned printed newspaper and making it harder to read by putting it online. And you couldn't tell anything from the URL structure, and you couldn't search it well, and basically everything um, broke around, around this time. And it took a long time. So, you know, so, so what, what you had was the content remaining the same and the means of distribution changing. Which made sense to the publishers because the publishers would say to themselves, well, we have loads of advertising revenue, but most of the advertising revenue we wind up spending on printing and distribution costs because it's incredibly expensive to do, you know, to print and distribute newspapers. This, is, this new medium is amazing because printing and distribution costs are zero, so we get to keep all of, all of our advertising revenue and not spend it all on printing and distribution. We wind up making a fortune, our profit margins go to the roof, and we're all going to be 
billionaires. And it, you know, this was, this was the dream of, of the internet, and so they didn't really think about how to optimize their content for the web. They just said, well, let's take our content and distribute it for free. Because you know, then we'll sell the ad, and instead of having to use the ad revenue to pay for distribution, we'll just take the ad revenue and put it in our pockets and we'll make a fortune. So that, as we know, didn't work for reasons which I'm sure I don't need to rehearse. But it, you know, it was basically, it, was, it wasn't until 2001 to 2003 or so that we started getting genuinely native, web native content really coming up. So this was, this was the era of the blogs. This was when you had um, movable type um, followed by you know, various other um, blogging software platforms. They were quite hard to use. I remember I tried to install movable type myself and it was non-trivial. But it created a network, again, like we're back to the idea of the network, we're back to the idea of people linking to each other, we're back to the idea of the, um, the fundamental thing that you do on the internet is link to things and people rather than just um, try and monopolize traffic for yourself. And the blogs were great at this. So we had this explosion of micro-publishers. And they all linked to each other. And they were, a lot of them would be really smart and really exciting. And micro-publishing has never gone away. And in fact, it has become Oops, there we go. Oh, oh, sorry. There we go. You get to, you get to hear me better now. Um, my, micro-publishing has become completely universal now. So Arianna Huffington said something very interesting once the, once the Huffington Post really started getting going. She said that self-expression is the new entertainment. People really love to be able to express themselves online. And this is something which is going to if you allow people to express themselves online, then they're just going to come back and come back and, and, and be incredibly loyal to you. And so in the early days of blogs, you would have the bloggers expressing themselves online. That was hard. Blogging was difficult to, to set up, technologically speaking. Um, then you had companies like Six Apart um, and uh, you know Blogger trying to make it easier. You then... Um, had the comments sections of places like Huffington Post, which became incredibly vibrant and popular, Daily Coast, places like that. There, there, anyone who made it easy for people to express themselves online generally did very well on the internet around this time. Um, and ultimately where we wound up was with Facebook and Twitter, which are platforms which are really just platforms of self-expression, and they make it super easy and you're on your phone and you just press a button or Instagram, you know, and it's done. I've taken the photo, it's shared. This is my kind of self-expression. It's super easy. You don't even need to know how to type. And, um, and that's wonderful. It's, it's incredibly democratic. And it's turned everybody into a publisher. And it's turned everybody with a Facebook account into a publisher. It, it, so, you know, my homepage for the internet is, is twitter.com, basically. That's where I go to get my news, where I go to find interesting things. It's where I go to know what's going on in the world and to find people who can explain what's going on in the world to me. And it's where I go to interact with other people. Everything happens more or less through my tweet deck. I don't need to go to Huffington Post. I don't need to go to the New York Times anymore. I don't need to go to individual blogs or you know, laboriously go down the blog roll or click down my list of RSS feeds or do whatever I needed to do because I have this beautiful stream that just brings it all to me. It's incredibly effortless. And, but, let, but, but, you know, so, so what we have is this, is this democratization of the, of, of, of finding and sharing content. So that, that whole role has now been largely taken out of the hands of the publishers, which is scary to them because it means we've lost the bundle, and we'll come, back, come to that in a second. Um, but before I do that, it's worth noting that, well, I think we have a, 
a timeline here. What you know, this is what this is what I've been talking about. You start in the mid '90s with the web native innovation of Wikipedia and places like Site.com, and then you know the big guys start coming in, Pathfinder. You remember them and New York Times and people like that who just kind of bigfoot their way onto the internet without really understanding how the internet works and pushing a bunch of content which doesn't feel very web native. And, and then what happens, interestingly, between 2003 and 2009 is that the blogs come along, the blogs become um, very popular and the legacy media starts going, oh, we need that, we need blogs. And so people like me get hired. So, so in 2006, I was hired by Portfolio, Condé Nast Portfolio, 2007. 2007, I was hired by Condé Nast Portfolio, which was this very glossy uh, business magazine, which wound up burning through about $100 million in the space of two years. And they said, you know, and, th and they said, we need an internet thing, you know, some kind of web. We need a blog. So, Felix, you can be the blogger. So just go off in the corner and link to things. And so, I, and, and we need a website. So they create, they bought portfolio.com, and they would, they, they, they set up a whole editorial structure of people who would write for the website, and you know, the people who wrote for the website were a little bit lower, second-class citizens compared to the people who wrote for the magazine, and um, and and they were absolutely not encouraged to be linking to people or anything like that. The, the idea was that. that you would create this amazing content on the website and people would come to the website and they'd read it and, and then you could sell ads against it. And when someone like me would come up to them and say, but you need to be web native, you need to have links, you need to be part of the conversation, they'd say, ah yes, well we have the blog. You know, you're our blogger, so you can do that. And then everyone would do this. The New York Times set up dozens of blogs. The New York Wall Street Journal set up all these blogs. Everyone decided they would set up a blog. And you had this, you had a few years there where you would have everyone, everyone would have, you know, th th there would be the publishers and they'd do their old, like, non web native, big footy legacy journalism online. And then off in the corner somewhere, you'd have what I call the blog ghetto, where, you know, it, that was the only place you could ever find external links on the website, was in the, it was in the blog ghetto. And what happened you know, first at places like Huffington Post, and then more generally, is that the bloggers started getting more respect, they started getting more traffic, they started making their way from the blogs into the um, mainstream organizations. They started getting paid the same, first the same as, and then even sometimes more than as journalists at the legacy organization. They started getting more power, they started getting older, they started becoming managers, and eventually, the bloggy sensibility of we shouldn't just copy what other people are doing, but we should just link to it and explain it and add to the conversation and that kind of, you know, you, you know, have lots of external links, put external links on the homepage, basic things like that, started filtering through into the organization as a whole. So that, so then you, get, so, so that, so what I have at the end here, 2009 to 2013, is what I call the, the product manager era. So what that is, is that you've incorporated bloggishness into your, into your product as a whole. You started hiring people with these, with this wonderful job title called product manager, which didn't really exist, um, you know, in the mid 2000s. And, and they would, and they would do things like, you know, SEO optimization. You know, or, or they would they, they would do things once Twitter and Facebook started taking off. You know, to, to put share buttons on things and try and optimize the social and, and and this kind of thing. And they would they would see everything as a product, and then they would try and make the product as, as web friendly and social friendly as possible because that was the way to maximize traffic. And you know, for the whole period here and for the foreseeable future as well, with a few tiny exceptions. The model is always, you know, we want to maximize traffic because tr because everything is sold on a CPM basis, and so what we need to do is 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 maximize the number of page views and uniques because that's where the marginal extra profits come from. And I can go down into the 
rabbit hole of the economics of publishing and why that model doesn't really make sense, which I won't because we have more interesting things to talk about. Um, but that's, that's where we got to up until around now. We are in this place where we have new homepage, which is social. Um, we have content, which, you know, you have websites like Viral Nova or um, Distractify, which can come up from nowhere and become enormous, more or less, overnight. We are in a world where if you're good at what you do and you have a brand name, that gives you an enormous advantage, but it's not necessary. So if New York Times launches the Upshot or if the Washington Post launches no more, that really helps because it comes from something which is respected in people, you know, especially the older generation um, really put some weight in that. So it, it's helpful to have that brand, but it's not necessary. Um, but what you don't have anymore is this era of being defined by the legacy bundle. And if you look at legacy media, there are two things which really define what you had pre-web. Number one is that you had the bundle. So you have the New York Times, all the news that's fit for print. You have your evening newscast at 10 p.m. on the television where they start at the beginning and they have their stories and they go through to the end and then once you've finished it, that is what you need to know. And it's a bundle and the bundle has to be exhaustive. If something important happens in the world, then it needs to be in the bundle and it's your job as the editor of the bundle to make sure that everything important that you need to tell your audience is in that. Um, that leaves obviously less space for sort of interesting idiosyncratic stuff which you're doing on your own. And then the other defining feature of the bundle is the periodicity of it. Um, it will come out every day at the same time, or every week at the same time. And you start with a blank page, or 30 minutes of blank airtime. And you're, you, you say to yourself, well, I'm publishing a newspaper, and I published a whole bunch of stuff in the newspaper yesterday, and now I have to publish a newspaper tomorrow, and I need to publish a whole bunch of more new stuff in the published in a newspaper tomorrow. That's why it's called news. And the published then the stuff that I publish in the newspaper tomorrow cannot be the same stuff that I publish in the newspaper today because people would feel ripped off. And so you 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 wind up on this hamster wheel of producing vast amounts of new content just because you have this space to fill. So that's you know, and so and that's why it can be it can feel weird to try and open a newspaper if you haven't been following the news for a while and, and, and try and understand what it's talking about because it's, it's just stuff which happened in the last 24 hours and it doesn't put things in perspective and it doesn't put things in context and it's confusing because it's designed for people who consume the same bundle day after day to, to sort of be able to follow things as they go along but it's none of this makes sense in an online world. None of this makes sense, on, uh, you know on the web. So where we're going, and this is, and this is where I'm you know, coming back to this idea of what happened in the early days of the web and you know, Wikipedia and Suck.com, is that we're going back to something which is web native. We are losing the bundle because bundles don't matter anymore. The links go straight into, deep into the content. They don't, people don't link to home pages. We're losing the bundle. We lose it and we've lost the periodicity. So if I publish something today, it stays up in perpetuity. I don't, you know, it's, if I publish it today, I publish it tomorrow and I publish it the next day and all, I, you know, I can update it. This is, this is really, um, this freaks out journalists, by the way. Um, partly for good reason. The, the idea that I can go back and update a story which I wrote last week or last month or last year um, it's obviously good for the reader because it means that they get up-to-date content and but it's also you know the, 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 the stewards of journalism schools and the, and, the, and, and the media ethicists get worried about this because they're saying well you know if you change something then people who quoted you before 
if, you know, track changes, Wikipedia, there's, there's, there's problems with this. But the point is that what you want to do is really work for the reader. You want to give the reader what's best for them. And so if what's important in the world is, you know, say, Ukraine, if I want to explain to you what's going on in Ukraine, there's a number of things which are really important which I need to explain to you so that you can understand what's going on in Ukraine. And those things don't change from today to, to tomorrow. But if I buy tomorrow's newspaper and look at Ukraine, most of what I'm reading about is just the delta. It's just the difference between what happened between today and tomorrow, which is incremental and not interesting and not important. And it should really be down at the bottom of the story somewhere or somewhere in the middle. And instead, it's all of the story, or it's certainly the top. So what you want in a web world, and this is, this is you know, one of the things that Ezra Klein is talking about over and over again at Vox.com, is that you want stock as opposed to flow. You want to give people the important story and then update it as necessary as news happens and use the news and use the fact that you're reporting the news to make sure that you know what you're talking about and you can update that story. But still, if I come along to Vox.com and I want to find out about Ukraine, what I see is the Ukraine ex explainer with the important stuff at the top. And then the other great thing about being digitally native is that because online there's no such thing as the average user, you can, you can, you can go into a lot of depth and people can follow you as much as, 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 as deep down that rabbit hole as they want. This is, you know, it's, it's what I call here the digital version of the inverted pyramid that you give people the big, important, broad brush at the top and then allow people to follow that card stack on Vox.com or, or, or whatever the equivalent is on your website into the, into the weeds and the explanations as much as they want. So if you're running a newscast on the television, you need to make sure that every single one of your viewers can understand every single one of your stories and that's a massive constraint. And similar with newspapers, they don't want to alienate their readers by printing stuff that many of their readers don't understand. This is not a problem online. You know, we're, we're, Paul Krugman has a blog where he puts all manner of stuff which he calls very wonkish and no one understands it or like three people understand it, it's fine. You can, you can put stuff online which is aimed at niche, audiences and you never finish updating you can create lots of hyperlinks one of the other great things about what's online is that it's the, the web has been completely embraced by the academy so the real experts in academia um, in the government in nonprofit sectors everything they do is online everything they do is free Everything they do can be linked to, and that gives people who want to explain the world the, mo the richest, most wonderful way of doing so. It's something which could never be done in old, in old media. It's a very new media thing to be able to do. It's a very web-native thing to be able to do. And this is why that now that the web, is, like now that media online is becoming truly web-native, that's why we're seeing this wonk renaissance, because what I'm talking about here is explanatory journalism. What I'm talking about here is putting the world into context. What I'm talking about here is, frankly, journalism, but it's journalism done in the way that it should be done rather than done in the way that we had to do it because of the constraints of the media that we had before, right? So, you know, we, we had this problem before that the we always had to be new tomorrow. And we had this problem before that we had to be exhaustive. And we had this problem before that we needed to bundle everything up into something which was accessible to everyone. And we've lost all of those problems and we can now explain the world in a much better way. So that's why the um, wonka sphere is, is, is emerging right now, if you will. So we have all of these sites coming up. 
Um, Ezra, you know, had his site at Wonglug. They've existed for a while at Atlantic City, some places like that. Um, and all of them are kind of, you know, I don't, they, 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 some of them look at the world in slightly different ways. I know most of these people, I've talked to them about it. They don't always agree with each other, but broadly they do. Broadly they're all agreed that the potential of journalism today is amazing because you lose the constraints which were frustrating and you gain the ability to do things which just make sense and which you always wanted to do if you were a journalist and never could before. So you get to link to people and you get to be very generous with who you link to because the more you link out, the more that your readers come back. And you don't need to keep, keep everyone to yourself. You don't need to try and explain the into entire world yourself. You can say, well, no, this person has worked, has worked it out. Go read this person because this bit of what I'm talking about is best explained over there. And, of course, you don't need to do everything in text anymore. The things which are best explained in text can be explained in text. The things which are best explained in video can be explained in video. The things which are best explained in animations or data visualizations or graphs or charts. One of the great things about No More, and it's, you know, No More was launched with an employee of one, basically, Dylan Matthews. Um, and it went from zero to three million uniques in about a month. It became the hottest property at the Washington Post. And the reason was because he understood the power of the chart. You know, Ezra kind of invented this idea of blah, blah, blah in one chart. And it's super powerful. Charts are incredibly powerful. Images are incredibly powerful. Animations are incredibly powerful. And you get to explain, you get to start with what you know and then express yourself in whatever way is most effective including the good old-fashioned type link and just saying, go, you know, here's a PDF which has been put out by this organization, read it. Um, so that's the promise of what I'm, what I'm calling wonk journalism, um, the wonkosphere, that we have finally managed to transcend the constraints of the news um, we are, by the way, and this is important, parasitical on the work of shoe leather journalists. We still need people out there discovering what's going on and reporting on what's going on and saying this is what is happening in the world right now. Everything that is done at these sites requires the general infrastructure of border journalism to exist. So that's important to remember. But these sites are great because they can put, they can collate everything, curate everything, aggregate everything, put everything into context, explain what's going on. And they can do it at a surprisingly low cost. Because even if people like Nate and Ezra and David Leonhardt are expensive, which they are, they also don't require the kind of resources that traditional journalists require. They don't require uh, massive legal teams to protect themselves from libel suits. They don't require huge travel budgets to send them into war zones. They don't, you know, you can more or less do all of this from the comfort of your own home in your pajamas. I mean, it's still kind of bloggy in its own way. And there are a few companies like the New York Times, like my company Fusion, which are willing to put a bunch of real resources into creating the interactives and the data visualizations. And those things can be quite expensive. But overall, if you look at page view, you know, the, the number of page views or the uh, or the number of words written or just the amount of stuff that gets done per person per year. Wonk explainery journalism is actually much more economical than most journalism because you don't have all of that, well, I need to strap on my shoes and go to where the news is happening and find out and report it and go through layers of editors and le lawyers and all the rest of it. So there, it's, it's reasonably economical it's much more valuable to the reader because they actually understand the world much more than they used to. Um, and it just adds this layer of context to the news, which I think the world has been sort of crying out for. And then the other thing, of course, that it does is it adds voice and attitude. And it gives you the ability to just be human and be yourself. 
And I think one of the things that started with sites like Suck and they're becoming much more common today is that you are not just allowed but encouraged to develop your own voice and to develop your own following and to become a little bit of a brand in and of yourself because that way lies the kind of relationship that the web is built on, that this kind of these, 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 these big forbidding bastions of impartiality uh, are becoming a thing of the past, please, God. And we're, inter we're entering a much more heterogeneous and lively kind of world. So that's, that's my big thesis, that the, that the reason we're seeing the, the Wonka theory exploding is because we finally reached the point at which people are embracing web native publishing rather than simply trying to transfer what they used to be, be doing online. And if you ask me where we're going, I think what I'll say is that these tools, these techniques, are going to make their way increasingly into the rest of the new style, much as the bloggish sensibility did a few years ago. And, and that pretty soon, this idea of wonk journalism as being separate and distinct from every other part of journalism, if we go forwards five, ten years from now, that's going to seem weird because everyone is just going to be doing this as a matter of course. I hope. Anyway, let me, let, let, let me stop there and see if any of you guys have some questions. Yes. <coughs> Thanks a lot, Felix, for that. I, I, I kind of uh, understand the, the, the whole picture. Just a question. Um, uh, a part I don't understand is, is when you say you don't, you, you don't need any more background, you don't need any more to explain. And that's all you do. That's, that, that's but 100% on, on the, sa on the same do. side, you, you, you say it's an explanatory journalism. It's a, it's a journalism who explain. It's a pedagogic journalism. So what, how, do you, how do you make sense of the, of, the two, of the two sides? On one side, you say you don't need any more background, you don't need to explain people what's going on, you go for it, and on the other side, you said it's uh, it's explanatory journalism. Okay, so so all right, so everything everything we're doing in this new world is explanatory. Everything we're doing is trying to make sense of the world and explain what's going on in the world. Um, the question is, how much background can you assume that your reader has? Um, do you need to spell everything out for them or not? And I remember that during the financial crisis, one of the best columnists during the financial crisis is, was, was Gillian Tett at the Financial Times. And she would write this series of columns about the risks being posed by synthetic collateralized debt obligations, which are these big financial instruments which wound up blowing up and destroying the world. And they were very important and very interesting columns. But they were also incredibly frustrating columns to read because they were all 1,200 words long and the first 900 words was Gillian carefully explaining to people who didn't know what a synthetic CDO was. And then finally, in the th last 300 words, she gets to try and squeeze in the point of the column and the point that she's trying to make. And that's just stupid. That kind of you know, copy and paste the same explanation each time you write the column is insane. You don't need to do that when you're online. You don't need to work from the assumption that your reader doesn't know what you're talking about because you can take that explanation, it can sit there permanently, or you can just bury it in a hyperlink, or you can put it in a Vox style card stack, or you can do whatever you need to draw attention to the thing which you're trying to say, those 300 words or more now that you have the space for it. You can go into much more detail about what you want to say, and you can allow the people who need the extra information and context to be able to find it because, because it's all there in perpetuity. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you um, see the relationship between those new sites doing explainer, wonk journalism, and Wikipedia because um, this whole idea of we explain the news is 
pretty close to what Wikipedia is doing at a very large scale. Um, this, the first question, the second one related to it, wouldn't, wouldn't that be kind of the same thing that you described before, that Wikipedia being something very web native and then media companies coming in and doing something similar but not that web native in a sense that they say we will do like the, the luxury product of Wikipedia and don't let everyone uh, contribute to it? Absolutely. And 100% and yes. So, so a lot of people have tried to create a Wikinews product um, with limited success. Wikipedia is okay at covering current events, but not great. It's very, like crowdsourcing works great if you're covering a subject which isn't dynamically changing in real time. It's much harder to do it if you're dynamically covering it in real time. But Wikipedia, Wikipedia is an in incredibly important resource for all journalists. If you're a journalist who doesn't use Wikipedia regularly, you're doing it wrong, you should. Um, and it is a model for how to explain the world in a stock versus flow kind of way. You know, it's all about the stock. These are static pages which get updated <coughs> over time. And the more that we, can, we as journalists can learn from how Wikipedia does things, the better. And if Wikipedia actually had been good at covering news and explaining current events, then we probably wouldn't even need to be doing this. It turns out not to have been amazing at it, and so other people in the news business are trying to do that, and so that's great. Uh, and the way they're doing it, you're right, is much more exclusive and much less generally crowdsourced. Um, as I say, people have tried to crowdsource this stuff in the past, and uh, I'm sure they will try to crowdsource this stuff in the future, and I'm sure that as these sites start to become more popular, you might well start seeing umbrella sites popping up, which you know, aggregate the best of what these guys are doing. Um, sort of you know, a meta wonk type thing, which could be crowdsourced in Wikipedia cells. Who knows how it's going to work? I hope that you know, more is more in this. In this respect, and I, I think you're absolutely, in general, you're absolutely right. Wikipedia is a wonderful model for this, and we should learn as much from it as possible, and definitely don't come at this with the idea of, oh, we know better than what they're doing, because we clearly don't. They've, they've got a lot right, and we haven't. We were talking about the, uh, the, 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 the enormous amount of news and stuff that, and content that we have on the internet. But uh, it seems like they, they're growing and growing year after year. And um, you said uh, each and every time a newspaper has to you know, put new things on a newspaper because it's like a blank page. You have to start from the beginning and put new things. But it looks like we're going to an era where we, we, we actually don't need that many contents. It's like why there is like thousands of newspapers, why there are thousands of news that most of the time are the same news, most of the same source, just repeated time after time. So you're saying uh, we, we need to change the way we express with, with different ways like images or infographic and stuff like that. But still, do we need so much stuff? So the history of legacy media is the history of local monopolies. You would, you would have local television stations which would be the main news source for a certain population. You'd have local newspapers, which would be, you know, news got carved up along geographic grounds. Uh, and not just between countries, but also within countries. So the newspaper you read up here in Perugia is going to be different from the newspaper you read down in Naples. And the, that makes no sense online. Uh, you want local news and Local news won't go away. But there's no particular reason why, you know, the Neapolitan newspaper should cover what's going on in Ukraine any differently than the newspaper in Madrid. So 
except for the language. That would be a bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so you still have language differences and you still have national differences. I think you're still going to have very different media worlds between countries. But within countries, you have massive amounts of duplication going on. And as a journalist, and I'm sure most of us are journalists, and we've all been in this situation where we're in a room much like this with this many journalists in it and someone up at the front who's some you know, official or <coughs> important person ostensibly seems to be committing news of some description and a bunch of you know, th 35 different journalists all writing down exactly the same thing and all calling it back to their editors and all publishing exactly the same thing. And that level of duplication is completely unnecessary. And it will be much better served, the world will be much better served if those 35 journalists are all off finding really good, juicy individual stories and publishing those instead of just repeating what each other are saying. So we can cut that 35 down to four, that would be awesome. Because then the other 31 can go out and do great stuff. We don't want to go down below four. We don't want to go down to one or zero because that is dangerous. But as long as you have a certain, you know, a, a little level you can have a little level of duplication is good. A little level of redundancy is good. But the massive over-redundancy that we've had, where everyone is writing exactly the same thing, is stupid. And we, we really don't need that. Uh, but don't you think that it is creating like a, an economical distortion? Like, we need that content, but there's a lot of need of this content. But we don't pay that much because everyone has it. Like an, in, in a, it, if you're working as a journalist, most of the time you have to produce content for a, a price that it's, it's going lower and lower because I don't think they really need it because it just, they need it because they have the platform, it's free, the platform is big and you can put everything in it easily. But still, I can't pay, I can't pay you for that, all the amount of content as I was paying like years before. Well, that, that gets into my other speech, which is the economics of online. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's, an, it's an important question. Um, I, would, I would simply remind you that no one, ever had, no one ever in the history of the world has ever paid for news. It's not something that people actually pay for. They do pay for, they have historically paid for um, the printing and delivery of physical newspapers, or at least part of it. So if I subscribed in the past to a physical newspaper, my subscription fee would cover part, but not all, of the cost of actually taking those dead trees and shipping them to my house. Um, and similarly for the television, you know, I, I, I could pay for some of those transmission costs and stuff. But the news itself has never actually been particularly valuable. There's been a couple of um, exceptions in the world of finance. Um, but that's about it. And occasionally in the world of sports. But that, and one of the reasons why there are so many sports newspapers in Italy is precisely because that's the one thing that people are willing to pay for. Um, but you're absolutely right. That the, the economics, if you want people to pay for news, and asking people to pay for news is actually a really good business model, and I thoroughly approve, and let's go out and do it, then what you need is precisely that unique content. You need to be one of those 31 people going out and finding new stuff that no one else has because then you have stuff that people are willing to pay for. And you're absolutely right, that people are not willing to pay for commodity news which everyone else has. Yes, again, Felix. Question on um, something, you, something common to all the websites you mentioned, and you didn't, uh, you didn't talk too much about it, is the fact that for um, 538, for Upshot, and for Vox and for Fusion, there will be a lot of algorithm, data visualization, uh, statistics, and, and which are very expensive, by the way, and, and very tough to do. You didn't mention it as, uh, as something um, um, common to that. So, yeah, so this is, this is part of going web native. Um, the, the web can do data visualizations much more effectively than any medium in the history of the news. And that's fantastic. And you're right, it's expensive. And one of the reasons why it's taken this long to get here is that the web operate, you know, online news operations have generally not had the budget to do it up until now. 
And now, for the first time, we're starting to see organizations like Fusion and ESPN and the New York Times really put serious financial resources behind these projects, the kind of resources which will pay for people to spend a lot of time going through data sets and making them look beautiful. Um, it's an incredibly rich opportunity, which we've only just scratched the surface of, and I can't wait to see where it goes. But yes, it's, 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 it's one of the great areas where you can do things online which you just couldn't do before, and the, the potential is enormous. Hi, uh, first of all, thanks for that. That was a very, very interesting talk. Um, I've just got a question based on a piece. I don't know if you read this. This was James Ball wrote something for The Guardian recently looking at, uh, by name, he was looking at 538 Vox and the upshot, but I think it was a general point, a sort of article just looking at now that all these new sites have started up, how they're doing. But one of the things I took from that, and I'm, I don't want to misquote him, so I've actually got it in front of me here. He said, one of the lines he says, um, should these sites... Uh, should these sites break news or just analyze it? And that one of the sort of points that kept coming through this was he was kind of implying that if you're not breaking news, you're not really doing journalism, um, or at least the ideal is to be breaking news as well as explaining. And I know you weren't being absolute either, um, but I wonder where you stand on that, because, I mean, the implication there was that it's all very well explaining stuff, but if you're not breaking stories, sort of winning awards, then... You know, like you're not you're not sort of at the cutting edge of journalism. Right. Um, breaking news is is the most masturbatory thing that journalists do. <laughs> it's it's um, other journalists really care about who got the story first. You know, breaking journalists is the, is the thing which you do in order to get the respect of other journalists. Um, breaking news is you know journalists will go. Bonkers! If you know, if I if I write a story now and someone else writes a story in five minutes, writes the same story in five minutes' time, I'll start phoning up their editor and screaming if their story, which appeared five minutes from now, didn't say this news was first reported by Felix. And that's so bullshit, right? No one who reads the news gives a flying fuck who broke it. <laughs> it's not important. <laughs> so you know, so, so for in terms of the ecosystem of the uh, of journalism, it's very important pe and journalists care. That's great. But as far as the reader is concerned, they don't care at all. Io lavorerei fare in italiano, non so se qualcuno può aiutarmi. Ecco, perfetto. Ok, grazie. Uh, rispetto a questo giornalismo che abbiamo definito low cost, c'è il rischio che... Canale 2, canale 2, canale 2, second channel, ok. Awesome, ok. Perfetto, ci siamo? Ok. Ok. Allora, rispetto a questo giornalismo che abbiamo definito low cost, c'è il pericolo che si scadi in termini di professionalità? Cioè, a chi dice questo cosa ti senti di rispondere? Ah, uh, yes. Well, yes. Um... The, the, if, someone is, if someone does something and isn't paid for it, they're an amateur. And if they're an amateur, they're not a professional. Um, and if you look at the blogosphere um, from, you know, in its early days, 2003, 4, 5, 6, most of it was, was amateur. And yet, in many respects, it was much higher quality than the professional journalism. I, when, I, when I hear the word professionalism, I, I hear it, it comes weighted with a lot of sort of legacy baggage. And some of that baggage is very important, and some of it isn't. And I certainly don't feel that something cheaper is therefore likely to be 
less useful to the reader or lower quality. Um, the correlation between price and quality in terms of on online content is basically non-existent. Just be, you know, there, there's the most expensive news is the television news, just because it costs a lot to create television news. But that doesn't make television news the best news. It doesn't make it the most important news. Um, you know, it doesn't even make it most likely to break news. Television news actually almost never breaks news. So no matter what criterion you use, just because you know, price and cost is, is, is irrelevant. I, 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 think, um, I think there are very professional amateurs. You know, it's a contradiction. But I think that people who take their craft seriously um, are going to be are going to be really good at what they do and people who don't aren't and the internet is going to be able to tell the difference and if they can t if they can do their craft well at a lower price that's great let's not get worried about that let's celebrate that okay però rispetto al termine che ho utilizzato non mi riferivo tanto diciamo al al costo dell'operatore o alla qualità, cioè che tipo di formazione ha un giornalista online o comunque un giornalista che vuole in un certo senso distaccarsi dal, dal media tradizionale? Non so se sono stato chiaro. Cioè, ok, no, I'm just... yes. in, in termini, ecco, qual è la differenza? Cioè, non c'è il rischio che poi tutti possano diventare giornalisti in questo senso cioè eh, che, cosa, cosa, qual è la differenza tra chi studia chi, chi, chi vuole diventare un professionista in questo senso no, non nel senso economico e chi crede e ce ne sono tanti purtroppo di essere un giornalista solo perché magari si, si butta in un blog awesome question I love this this is, this is, this is what I live for ok Where to start? <laughs> Journalism school is a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> The best school is actually to go out and get your own blog and do it. The best school is to, if you can, you know, go to work for a news organization, to go to work for a news organization. Every, all, all the best journalists I know learned what they did by doing it for some organization or other. Journalism school is it, it's, it's a way of getting your foot in the door. It's a credential. It's a way of meeting the right people. But what you learn in journalism school is, has very dubious relevance to anything that you actually wind up doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the best way to become a good journalist, and certainly the best way to become a good online journalist, is to do stuff online. And this is the, one of the great, wonderful, genius things about the Wonka sphere, about, about Wonk journalism and the Wonk bubble. So one of my favorite examples here is this kid called Evan Soltis. Evan Soltis is an absolute genius. He's written for Bloomberg View. He's written for Wongbook. Now he works for um, Vox.com. He's 19 years old. He's a, a student at Princeton University. Uh, he will never study journalism. He should never study journalism. He had a blog, which a bunch of really smart people, you know, Paul Krugman or... or whoever would, would link to quite regularly, Brad DeLong. And he, had, he, he, he showed after writing his blog for a while that he was really good at writing this blog, that he was smart, that he could do good analysis, that he could be part of the conversation. And there are hundreds of people out there doing this kind of thing. And if you do it well, then you get noticed, you get discovered, and then you wind up working for Bloomberg and Washington Post and Vox.com and so on and so forth. So journalism school is the blogosphere. It's a much better way of going to school than sitting in a classroom and listening to some 55-year-old telling you about how things used to be done in 1974. The, the quality has never had a better opportunity to rise to the top. 
You don't need to be in New York City or in Milan or in Rome. You don't need to know the right people or go to the right universities in order to get discovered, in order to get noticed, in order to get a job. You can just, no matter where you are on the planet, if you have an internet connection and you can think clearly and you can write clearly, you can prove that you're a good journalist and, and get a good job that way. And this is a much better way of organizing things than getting a whole bunch of kids to sit in the classroom and then give them grades at the end of the year. That doesn't help. So, you know, do I worry that bloggers think of themselves as journalists? No, I'm extremely excited that bloggers think of themselves as journalists because that's where the next generation of journalists is going to come from. Hi. Uh, lately, a couple of American news sites have closed down their comments section, and I was wondering what the role of reader contributions are in one blog uh, journalism. Very good question. Um, comments. There's there's what 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 Nick Denton calls the tragedy of the comments. No one really. There, uh, many many people have tried to solve the problem of comments with varying degrees of success. Um, there are good comment sections out there. Uh, to this day, despite the fact that it's 15 years old, the Marginal Revolution comment section is fantastic. If you go to LinkedIn, which I think is, is a very interesting model, the comments on LinkedIn tend to be very high quality because people are always posting under their own name and they're posting to potential employers. And so their potential employers get to see everything that they've commented and so they start being a lot more self-conscious about what they're writing and generally only write better stuff. So there are ways of doing comments right, but at the same time, the fact is that comments have become radically dispersed. That 95% of the comments on any given piece of journalism are going to not appear on that piece, but are rather going to appear on Facebook or on Twitter. That's where the comments have moved to. Um, and that's just the way it is. And there are positive and negative um, consequences of that. The positive consequences are that you want all of those comments end up basic, basically driving traffic back to the original piece in the way that comments on the piece never could. Uh, the negative thing is that you can't, you can no longer collate the conversation around the piece in one place. Um, so you know there are trade-offs. But yeah, the co the co there's never been more commenting about stories, but it's just never been less visible. And would you might uh, tell us something about your new endeavor? About, about your new work? Your new oh. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I try not to talk about myself too much. It's really boring. But, um, but my new job is working for a com company called Fusion, which is a television station in Miami. And the fact that it's a television station and not a company which tries to make money by selling ads on digital content is incredibly freeing. Basically what it means is they want me to go out and create great stuff on the internet generally, and so I can use whatever platforms are best for telling stories on the internet, and that might be these sites, it might be YouTube, it might be Instagram, it could be any number of different things. And try and reach the audience where the audience is rather than asking the audience to come to me. So I find that exciting. They have amazing resources in terms of things like data visualization, in terms of animation, video, of course, because they're a television station. And because they're a young television station, they're only six months old, they don't have a huge sort of superstructure of management and old school television people who know how it, things are meant to be done and they, and they actually really care about being digital because their business model is to appeal to millennials, you know, people under the age of 32 or so, and those people don't really watch television. <laughs> and so if you want to reach those people, you have to reach them online. And so, you know, I'm online, I understand the m online medium, and so they're saying, they're just kind of coming to me and saying, go out, find those people, reach them where they are, explain things to them. That's, yeah, people, one of the things which I, which I, I am very, I feel very strongly about, is that millennials are not stupid, <laughs> which you would never guess if you looked at most of the material which was ostensibly aimed at them. 
there's, there's this thing out there in the journalism world that if you want to reach people in their 20s, you need to dumb things down and make it stupid, and that's insane. Um, they're smart, they're, but they don't want the same kind of news. They don't want horse race political journalism. That, you know, they, they, they want something new, and they want something lively. They want something with voice. They want something with attitude, and they want to under, you know, have, have a relationship with, the, with, with people who are serving them information. And I think there's really exciting ways of doing that, which most of which have yet to be discovered, and I want to be one of the people who are trying to discover it. So that's what I'm going to be trying to do trying to do at Fusion. Um, I have no idea whether I'll succeed or not, but it's going to be a lot of fun to find out. Hi. Uh, you said before <coughs> that it's not necessary to, to study uh, in order to be, mm, become a journalist. And, uh, well, to study journalism, of course. And I'm quite convinced about that. But, but then I, I wonder about one thing. Um, I studied biology. And so I, I tend to, to see things in an evolu evolutionary perspective. So I if I think about the information world, uh, I imagine that there is a kind of selection that decides uh, which topics, which, uh, which articles, which bloggers became uh, relevant or not, and, and, and which journalists. And in, in that case, I wonder which are the, the selection criteria I mean, in, s in some cases, uh, you may become considered uh, as a journalist because, you're, you're because of the quality of what you write. But in other cases, you, can, you may become uh, relevant because you are good in getting noticed. So it's not really the same thing. Uh, I, I don't know if, if I managed yeah, to... Yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying, um, but I would say that was ever thus. If you look at journalism in 1970 or 1930 or 1870, it was always the same. The, the big name journalists, the successful journalists, some of them became successful because they were great at breaking news, some of them became successful because they were great at mark raking, some were good gossip, some had great sources, some were just great writers. There's always a huge range of different skills which can bring you success in journalism. There's nothing new about that. Now, is that still the case? Yes. Um, and that's great, I would say. You know, I, but yes, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of different ways. And, and, and there are journalists who are going to become successful who you are going to sort of sneer at a bit. And that's fine. That's good. It, I'd be worried if that wasn't the case. Very stupid question, but why is it called a uh, wonk journalist? <laughs> uh, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, the, I, um, well, I mean, Ezra, Ezra called his blog wonk blog. Um, you know, it, wonk, wonk, wonkery. I think, I think wonk basically came from the distinction between politics and policy. The the politics is, is the horse race, is who's going to win the election, and policy is like, you know, let's actually try to understand the mechanisms of Obamacare. And because this kind of journalism cares about substance more and can really explain things more, it got that name. Um, but I think that's it, I think, in terms of time. I apologize if there are qu questions I didn't answer. I apologize if I answered too many. Um, but Thank you very much. Prova. Ok, io vi ricordo che se vi interessano questo tipo di temi, Marchettone, sul sito del, del festival per tutto l'anno, ogni settimana curiamo una rassegna in cui si parla di questi argomenti e spesso sono citati gli articoli del nostro speaker. Grazie a tutti. <ride>